So I think we're going to uh, try and start this um, panel relatively on time. Uh, we, um, <clears throat> uh, we've had a, a series of panels already that I, I trust have made you um, scared about the future of the country. And um, the point of this panel is to make you um, scared about um, your status as a consumer. Um, and uh, except for Tom, because Tom likes to disagree, <laughs> as you have already seen. <laughs> Tom will be our contrarian. and he will tell you that um, financial firms have your best interests at heart, and so there's nothing to fear. Uh, no, uh, we're not really here to tell you about fear. We're also here to tell you a little bit about hope. Hope is part of the, um, uh, the message of this panel, as you'll see in just uh, a moment, uh, because uh, I really feel, and I think you'll see from the panelists, that um, new techniques in uh, technology, uh, big data, analytics, um, and some changes in the regulatory landscape could make uh, the world a lot better for consumers going forward. So uh, hope and fear um, are both part of the show. And right now I'm fearful that my slides are not loaded. Uh, because they're not. Let's see. So this is that point, I was just saying to um, Kabir, um, when I teach my classes, I'm very bad at this, as you can see, and there's a little button that I can push, the help button, and someone comes right away. And the only problem with this setup is the help button isn't on this piece of wood. This seems much better. I'm so much happier. I'm almost happy. Now I have Jenny here. Now I'm really happy. Awesome. Okay. So uh, if you're wondering what, what goes wrong, what could go wrong with technology, you now know. Um, I'm delighted to be here um, uh, beginning our discussion on big questions about big data. Um, we're going to be um, uh, talking about really an eclectic mix of, uh, of hope and fear. Um, we're going to talk about uh, consumer ownership of financial data. We're going to talk about uh, privacy. We're going to talk about uh, discrimination. We're going to talk about some broader uh, themes about the interaction between data and policy. I mean, in each of these areas, I think you're going to see there is um, uh, some upside potential um, and some downside risk. So let me um, just try and frame the conversation um, uh, quickly for each of these, and then we'll uh, open it up to our uh, distinguished um, panel. So uh, the first set of issues. Um, is around uh, ownership, consumer ownership of financial data. Um, uh, right now, um, we live in a world that um, has some grayness to it uh, about whether consumers uh, can fully actualize uh, ownership of their own financial information. So what do I mean by that? Uh, let's say you are um, a customer of a bank uh, and you would like to um, share your information with a third-party app. For those of you over um, 14, an app is the thing on your phone um, that lets you manage your finances. Uh, you can do that, uh, but it turns out that financial firms uh, where you store your data may have all kinds of ways of making it hard for you to actually get access to your own data and to authorize others to get access to your data um, to, um, to be able to use your financial management tool in the way that you want. And there are some legitimate uh, trade-offs involved in, um, in financial management tools of uh, pr uh, privacy, security, uh, integrity of the data. Um, and then there are also some issues around um, whether uh, the people who are holding onto your data, your bank, for example, may not want to share it because 
if they share it, um, they might have to uh, share you as a customer, uh, as opposed to um, having uh, the ability to make a lot of money off you um, directly. Um, or um, uh, think about account switching. So uh, it's very hard to switch bank accounts in the United States. Uh, Lots of people want to switch their bank accounts because their banks occasionally do things to them they don't like. Like, um, let's say you're a customer of, uh, say, Wells Fargo. Um, you might not be that happy with Wells Fargo because Wells Fargo was um, fraudulently using your information to open um, shadow accounts and charging you money for it. That seems like something that would get you rather upset. Um, but if you want to switch your bank account, you have to... Um, change all of your direct deposits and your bill pay. That's, in one sense, not a ton of work, but it's a hassle. Uh, and you might not switch um, your bank account as much uh, because of that. And one of the effects of uh, you not switching very often is maybe the bank can impose lots of pain on you, more pain than they otherwise would if you could switch. Uh, so if we reduce switching costs, uh, we might be able to uh, improve competition in the financial services pace and drive down overdraft fees and other f uh, contingent fees in the marketplace. So <clears throat> both of these um, uh, problems, financial management uh, and um, account switching, could be significantly advanced if we had a universal portable financial ID uh, that we could then use um, to share information with third parties when we want to not share it when we don't want to, and keep it secure. Uh, and this would also um, reduce the costs of account switching, reduce friction in the system, and therefore increase competition. Uh, and that would, I think, uh, be all to the good. So ownership is a key issue we're going to wrestle with uh, on this panel. Um, a second key issue we're going to wrestle on this panel um, is privacy. Now, um, again, for the younger people in the audience, you might say, well, does privacy really still exist as a value? Um, after all, uh, people seem willing to share all kinds of things um, in social media um, that you know, I would find a little bit embarrassing to share with people I know really, really well in private, um, uh, but is made public. Uh, so, uh, but if privacy is a value, and I think it still is a value for many people, um, the ability to decide whom to share with, under what circumstances, uh, how and for how long, um, uh, is um, potentially subject to uh, further attack in this age of uh, big data. Um, the third uh, big issue that we're going to be tackling with, uh, wrestling with on this panel um, has to do with uh, discrimination. Um, so. Uh, in some ways, um, big data can uh, reinforce uh, discrimination in our society. Um, big data uh, makes it easier for firms to um, uh, replicate, um, unintentionally replicate, uh, existing uh, patterns of credit access or of financial access uh, by using additional data sources. And, um, Machines, unless you um, uh, uh, work very hard at it um, and do all kinds of special things, will end up replicating um, the existing patterns of discrimination that we see. Um, on the other hand, um, big data might uh, be used to help overcome discrimination. Big data might be uh, a way of, of finding uh, new, useful, um, valid information about consumers that opens up access, that reduces um, uh, barriers, um, that uh, improves credit scores, that um, uh, makes it easier to provide um, financial products to people who previously didn't have it, and that basic trade-off um, exists. Um, and lastly, um, we're going to be talking about broader themes of how um, data, uh, big data in particular, interact with policymaking. Um, and I mentioned briefly this morning, but we'll return to that theme uh, in our discussion, um, ways in which a policy is challenged um, uh, in the big data world we live in. Partly it's um, challenged when policymakers don't have access to any data at all. And I think we've heard a lot of um, depressing things about that this morning um, that Dick is going to fix single-handedly. Um, uh, but... Um, 
We also have problems of the use and misuse of data uh, when, the, when the data exists. Uh, I mentioned the, the problem of amnesia. Um, uh, it may be possible for, um, for members of Congress, for example, um, with apologies to Graham, uh, to forget things they know because lobbyists ask them to. Um, uh, and so the intersection of politics and, uh, and data, I think, is important to keep in mind. Uh, we've already talked about the problem of information arbitrage, um, which exists uh, among the regulatory agencies and in the private sector that inhibits sound policy making. We have the basic problem of analytic failure, uh, of not uh, being able to understand uh, well enough, fast enough, um, what to do with the data we do have in order to make good policy. Um, and lastly, I think there are aspects of technology um, that are quite challenging for policy. So, for example, um, uh, the uh, basic um, uh, function of automaticity uh, um, in financial decision making um, makes it challenging for regulators or policymakers to engage. So, if you have a, a high frequency trader engaged in widespread, scalable, uh, immediate actions automatically, it's very hard for policymakers to. Uh, intervene to figure out what to do about it. Uh, so I think fundamental challenges for policy as well. Um, with that, let me just say a word or two about our, our panel. Uh, you have their full bios um, um, in um, your handout. Um, but we're going to um, uh, first hear from uh, Kabir Kumar, um, who is uh, an Omidyar uh, network. Uh, we're then going to next to um, uh, hear from uh, Tom Brown, uh, who met earlier uh, today in the audience, um, who will say nothing controversial. Um, uh, then um, uh, uh, from Marisa Bel Torres from the National Council of La Raza, uh, and then finally uh, from Graham Steele, um, who is uh, on the U.S. Uh, Senate uh, Committee on Banking, uh, Housing, and Urban Affairs as a, um, a staff member, I should say, not a member. Um, and um, uh, I'm delighted to uh, hear from them. Without further ado, let me uh, turn it over to uh, Kabir. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. I have a few slides, but I wanted to say uh, some things uh, before that. So l let me give you a bit of a background on, on Omidia Network. So I realized as I had some conversations this morning and over lunch that that might be useful. Um, uh, Pierre Omidyar founded eBay, and um, uh, after that he, you know, the money he made eBay, he uh, created a private foundation. He realized over time that eBay was having more impact in people's lives than some of the things that uh, people were doing through the private foundation. So he kind of evolved his model and came up with the Omidyar Network, which is essentially a set of organizations. There are two main ones. Uh, an LLC that functions just like a, a, a VC and, and, a, and a private foundation. So that allows us, and it's a partnership model, that allows us on, on the team to be able to use different instruments uh, uh, to play a role in the market. It's philanthropic in nature. It's a market development uh, orientation. So we are not investing um, because there's an exciting entity, but we're investing because we believe it plays a part in a bigger story put it that way. Um, yeah. So, and, uh, the, you know, we are investing in fintech firms, and we're also investing in companies that are uh, in, in the data space, let me put it that way, and, and perhaps in personal data management. So an investment we recently made uh, based out of the UK called Digi.me. It's a company that allows you to manage your own data. Um, um, you know, and, and there are lots of challenges with that, and I'm happy to talk about that, about that later. Uh, because of that work, we are, uh, uh, you know, I can talk about what these companies are doing, but I think one of the things that interests us is uh, sort of what, what's happening at the level of the plumbing, let's say, what's happening at the level of the infrastructure that enables these innovations uh, to flourish in a way where consumer interests are, are protected in a way where uh, data is being used um, uh, to give us new services and products, but without necessarily abusing that data against our interests. So I think that's a question at the infrastructure and the plumbing level. And something that's been brewing and uh, reached an interesting point just this past weekend 
has been uh, the sharing of data uh, that uh, Michael set up uh, between um, large banks that have a lot of data, uh, our data with them, uh, with fintech players and fintech companies. And there are companies that sit in the middle that facilitate movement of that data. And there's been some tension, uh, and you might be reading about it. Uh, Jamie Dimon earlier this year, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, letter to shareholders, talked about how he would like to change the mechanism from uh, uh, pulling of data to pushing of data. And so the bank would be really controlling how the data, how the data moves. This, just this past Sunday, uh, the director of the CFPB said that uh, uh, CFPB will be prioritizing how uh, consumer rights can be protected in the sharing of data. And in fact, uh, under, the, under Dodd-Frank, um, this little known piece of legislation, um, you, uh, CFPB actually has the right under 1033 to, to make rules around sharing of data so that they are, it's machine readable. What I've been discussing with Michael and, and picking his brains and uh, I'm trying to figure out ourselves is that is that enough? So, you know, once you take that step, it's a very important step, potentially a long overdue step. Uh, is that really going to create that kind of enabling environment for innovation? What more do we need to do? And uh, my mind goes to even, even deeper into the plumbing, arguably, uh, into, into sort of what's really happening at the infrastructure level for that to really work well. So if I can get the information, is there really a consent framework that allows for that information to flow between companies? If I can get that information, is it truly secure at the end of the day? Are the banks right in their concerns that this data is not secure? So even though you take that step, is it really ensuring um, uh, that we are, we are standing on firm grounds uh, to really be able to bear the fruits of that step? And most of the work I've done in the last few years has been in emerging markets. And there have been some interesting things happening in other parts of the world where you are arguably innovating in a white space, even in the public sphere, right? So public interventions and public good orientations are happening where the grounds are, uh, you know, you, you, they sort of, not a lot has come before you. So you're really thinking what you could do differently if you were doing things from scratch. And there are two examples that come to mind that I thought would be worth highlighting today uh, to share with you. One is from Estonia and what they have done to really digitize the economy and what's happened at the infrastructure level that's worth highlighting. And the other is India. And I have to say, I'm not an expert in either of these systems and what's happened, but I think they, they give us some interesting ideas for what we could do here. And of course, we cannot do exactly what happened in Estonia and India for a variety of reasons, which all of you smart people understand. Uh, but we, we can definitely learn from them, I think, and there could be basis for for looking at that moving forward. So let me start with Estonia. So this is, uh, in Estonia, um, you have a system where almost all, I would I, I'd say all public databases and, and, and a large set of private data databases are linked. So just above that middle line on that diagram, I have it in front of me here. Uh, you see public sector databases, you know, the health insurance register, the population register, the vehicle, vehicle register, etc. This is just a schema, some examples. Public sector and private sector. From the private sector, you have banks, data from the banks, data from the telecoms, data from the energy sector. Um, that's linked uh, with a consent-driven um, layer that sits on, inter on the internet protocol. So it allows data to move freely between these different databases. And each of these data owners um, actually uh, have applied API so that movement happens frictionlessly. Now, this is a technological intervention. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm, I'm giving you sort of the highlights of what's interesting about, about this. It's a technological uh, intervention. It's, it's federated. So what it's saying is there's no, not the sort of aggregation of data, but Data exists already, it's already been aggregated. How do we make it move in a way that's good for those companies, those data aggregators, as well as individuals, as well as the economy? And this is one, one intervention. The consent framework works because it sits on a national electronic ID. Uh, 
So it's anchored in a unique ID system, which, uh, as I was discussing with, uh, uh, with someone earlier, is likely uh, not going to happen in this market. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, it's a long shot. There have been many attempts and their ideas, and there might be creative solutions, but it seems like it's a long shot. But it, it, it points to an important design element in trying to get so something like this to work really well. Um, as a result of this uh, system, what this chart is showing, so the, the top uh, line the, dot, the small dotted line is the growth in services. So just focus on that is growing a lot more than the bottom line, which is the growth in data repositories. So if you have an architecture that's really efficient, the need for further aggregation of data goes down over time, but it does not hurt the growth in services. This is important because you're getting growth in services, but you're also reducing vulnerability in the architecture. Ultimately, if the data is getting aggregated multiple times, it's at risk for all the things that we talked about in the first panel today. So to achieve that, you need a way to link all these data, uh, data systems. You need a consent framework that allows for that data to move. And for that consent framework to really work, you, you need a national ID. That's the message uh, from the Estonians, at least, to us. As a result of this, you can do a whole bunch of things very quickly in Estonia, including vote takes 90 seconds on average to vote, <laughs> I believe. Uh, you can, an, an average person can file taxes uh, in, in five minutes. Uh, you can, you know, sell a car remotely in 15 minutes. Uh, so, you know, these are just examples from one study, but a lot, as you can imagine, if you have, you know, this level of digitization in the economy, sitting on this kind of infrastructure, a lot of things can happen very quickly. Um, but it took Estonians, this is now a population, I think 1.5 million, I think 15 years to get to this point. And it was just, and you know, I, I showed you the schema for, for the technology, but it was not just a technological intervention, it was a series of legal interventions. Right? So it was people coming together both at the level of technology and law, something like this to happen over 15 years in a population of 1.5 million. The other example is, is from India. So this is, uh, in India, as you know, as of this summer, a billion people are in a national data, biometric database. So again, this architecture, I'm not advocating for national IDs, I just want to be very clear, but I, I am pointing to digital infrastructure where that's an important design element. Uh, I'm not advocating for that. But why can't, but no, just out of curiosity, like why can't you advocate for a national digital ID? Just because it's like too, like they'll, they'll, they'll get tarred and feathered by this group of academics? I mean, like what, why, why not? Be, because, no, 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 I, I, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I um, personally am divided in the value of creating a central database that has everyone's information in it, you know? And I think all of us personally feel a degree of ambivalence and concern towards that. You would be, you know, not being honest with yourself if you did. You can see the public policy benefit of it. Uh, you could see what you can do with it. And there are ways in which you could do it where it can protect people's interests, and I've seen that happen. Uh, but it's still a personal question for me. So I'm not advocating for it, but I see the benefits of it. Um, in India, you have a billion people in this, in this database. Um, and, and they have built a sort of series of, of technologies, uh, effectively, API standards that sit on top of this, um, on this standard uh, national uh, unique identifier. And there are three, uh, four parts to it. One is um, an ability to sort of do KYC, know your customer, for any service from anywhere in the country remotely. So set of technologies, protocols, and APIs that allow that to happen. Um, a, a system that allows, a set of standards that allow sort of a Dropbox on steroids to emerge in the market. So you have many Dropboxes that are far more secure, far more effective, built on a, per, on a standard and a protocol that's built on the, the unique identifier, that's the national ID. And then you have a cashless layer, which is um, a instant payments system. It is instant, as in the very minute you send money, it shows up in another person's account, and it's any account of any kind, and it's a push and pull mechanism, 
Uh, it it uh, actually goes beyond accounts. You can create unique addresses for yourself. And so regardless of how many accounts you have behind that address, you can move money. And then the last layer is a consent layer. So there's a piece of technology that enables the secure movement of data uh, backed by consent. So you can validate that consent. And it's uh, arguably more robust, the Indians would argue, because it sits on this unique identifier, national ID. What's interesting is that in each case, it's, it's, it's being implemented as a public good. So the national, the EKYC is run by a, a government entity. Uh, the, the sort of standards and protocols for this Dropbox and steroids is uh, managed by the Department of Electronics and Technology. The, the payments layer is run by what could be considered sort of Visa before it, it had an IPO. So it's, owned, <laughs> it's, the, it's the National Payments Corporation of India, owned by all the banks. There's only one foreign bank that's a member, that's Citibank. And, and a consent layer that is currently being managed because it's largely being used by, by the financial sector, by the central bank. So it's not one government entity, but multiple entities that are playing a role in this infrastructure coming together. So I, I bring these up not to advocate for a national ID or to advocate for these particular systems, but they present to uh, you know, the kinds of solutions you would need for us to be able to get to the true movement of data that's secure, that's consent-driven. And, and I might go as far as to say that, you know, I feel there are lots of interesting things happening. You, you heard this this morning, I was telling Michael during the break, but they seem sort of very much in their own part of the universe, right? So there's some effort to, to orchestrate all of this, to stitch all of this together. Uh, I don't know what that would look like. Is it someone at the White House with the mandate to be able to do that or at the Treasury with the mandate to be able to do that. So you take what's happening in the real ID space, you take what's happening with, on questions around data portability, um, you take all the different pieces of efforts that are happening already and, and you know, create a common architecture that drives all of this. So it's not happening in these different parts of the broader universe, unlinked, but there's something that's bringing them all together. Thank you. Thanks very much. They should be. Okay. How do you get to them? You ask Christy. Okay. Um, so <laughs> while Christy figures out where my slides are, a um, couple of points. Um, so on this, this national ID, uh, so a couple of observations. Um, one is it's really odd, I think, uh, and was having this conversation with folks from the OFR yesterday, that we live in a world in which um, uh, at this point in time, setting aside sort of the Hobbesian world in which we, you know, lived in thatched huts with um, dirt roofs, like <laughs> government confers identity on us in all meaningful sense, um, right? Uh, as we know from the birther movement, right? Like you can't prove who you are in any meaningful sense until you present your birth certificate to Donald Trump, right? <laughs> and that birth certificate is a government issued piece of paper that is notarized by someone and signed by the doctor who gave birth to you, right? Like that is fundamentally a government thing. Um, I have uh, a single unique identifier that follows me throughout my employed life, um, the social security number, which is used, hashed or unhashed as the way that um, uh, those I do not think of them as miraculous entities, probably because none of them um, have hired me to work for them. Um, uh, the credit bureaus use to <laughs> drive their relational databases. I, you know, if they ever do want to hire me, you know, we can talk about it. But um, uh, so and and so we have these things, right? I think the the piece that's frustrating um, uh, is that that our our political infrastructure has been so badly broken for so long that we can't make the kinds of policy investments that places like Estonia and India are making, even though um, uh, the, the sort of coast-educated Chicagoan in me knows that the reduction in transaction costs applied to our economy would in yield enormous improvements um, from a social benefit perspective. And, and like they're just, it's just broken, right? Because there are too many political constituencies who, who enjoy rents from, from some aspect of, of the system as it exists today. And, you know, so 
then you just have to accept that that's the way the world is and work with it that way um, and make the little, the, the, take the gains where you can get them. So, so shifting to where we can, where there, are, where there are gains and where we don't need Congress to make new law since like that's impossible. <laughs> uh, we'll, start, we'll start there. Kabir sort of stole my thunder because um, uh, I was going to break the news to you <laughs> that, um, that Rich Cordray had made news at Money 2020. I'm a little hoarse because that's where I started the week. Um, so I, I captured the two quotes that, that jumped out of the conversation for me. The other person that he's sitting with, by the way, is Joanne Barefoot, um, a fairly well-known former regulator in the space with a real passion for um, consumer protection and consumer interests in financial services. Eliza um, told me they are. Oh, there you go. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, uh, so so um, what, what Rich said was that, that, um, that consumers have the right to delegate access uh, to their... Um, to their financial accounts. Um, and in language that is unmistakable, right, he is gravely concerned that incumbent financial institutions, i.e. banks, uh, depository banks in particular, um, are looking to ways to shut off access to that. And that's a problem. Uh, and, and the Bureau obviously has enormous tools, uh, even if he is subject to pre presidential appointment, like for five minutes. Uh, to, to exercise supervision, examination, and enforcement um, with respect to the degree to which financial institutions are adhering to this, um, uh, to this mandate. So like then what is he talking about, right? Like, well, so um, this is what he's talking about. Oh, oh, oh one more, went too far, because it doesn't change it here. Um, so, so I think of this as section 1033 of Dodd-Frank. The formal statutory site is 12 USC section 5533. Uh, and, and what it says is that a financial institution, um, uh, subject to stuff that the Bureau might do in terms of rulemaking, must make available to a consumer upon request information related to the consumer's accounts at that institution um, uh, about a whole bunch of stuff, right? So transactions and information related to the account, cost, charges, and usage data. Uh, and then the last sentence is like, this is, so we don't yet have rules. Um, we have a self-enforcing statutory requirement. And then we have this last sentence. So what do they have to do, right? So the information shall be made available in an electronic form usable by consumers. So what does this mean? This will be, until the Bureau gets around to making rules, uh, a subject of much dispute to sort of anchor the conversation. Like, I think it's interesting to think about, like, how are consumers sort of voting with their feet about how to use this data? Um, and so Pete Daffern didn't even know, but he was actually giving away one of my, my punchlines, because I, I have one of those slides, right, that shows you the 150 people um, who are uh, working with consumers in some way or another to get access to information in um, a transaction account at a financial institution. So this particular slide um, is divided by services that we typically associate with banks, right? So um, you can start wherever on the slide you like. I'm like a consumer guy, right? So uh, I care about mobile banking, um, personal financial management, lending and financing. Um, uh, like as an individual, advising and investment stuff is interesting, but for the vast majority of American households, it's irrelevant. Um, uh, but, but even in those other three sectors that I really care about, like access to this information is critical. Um, uh, and it, it enables, um, it enables uh, a couple of things that I think are interesting to think about again to sort of channel um, uh, uh, Robert Coase or even Richard Epstein, right? So, so thinking hard about points of friction in lives of individual people and in which the inability to access information and to apply intelligence leads to bad outcomes. Like, that's like a complicated thing to say. What do I mean? Overdraft. Right? Like, um, so an overdraft charge, right, uh, information sits within the bank that may enable me to avoid that charge, right? The bank at that particular moment in time has no particular interest in sharing that information with me. Um, certainly not in a timely enough way to avoid the $39 charge, right? But um, Ethan Block at Digit, um, uh, not a client, but I guess I do have an investment in it, so I will sort of raise my hand in that regard. Um, small, not material, but still I'll disclose it. Um, uh, so he is 
interested in preventing that overcharge to the extent that he can, he can arbitrage the difference between putting those funds in the account and the cost to, the, um, the cost to him of providing those funds. Right? And there are a whole set of places around the bank where there's the ability to, to, to effectively unbundle um, the set of services that are provided by typical banks in their relationships with consumers, and let's be clear, corporates too, right? Um, uh, so so a, 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 a sort of thought experiment in terms of thinking about what banks are, right? You can just think of them as siloed databases, right? Siloed databases of debits and credits. And all we're talking about is creating an information layer that enables people to read and write on top of those ones and zeros. Now, I know that banks don't really want to think of themselves that way because we don't pay a lot of money to people who run databases. Um, uh, so, and, and, and just to give you a sense of, of, there's sort of two ways of thinking about this that I'd like to identify. I cannot claim credit for either of them. Um, I have a really smart friend, friend named Kausik uh, Rajgopal. Kausik is the, I guess he's now the head of McKinsey, like, west of the Mississippi or something <laughs> like that. Um, uh, um, and the head of McKinsey's payments practice, which is how I came to know him. And so as they think about what, what a, a read-write world of banking looks like, uh, the analogy that they use, and I think this is, this hope maybe resonates with people here, is um, thinking about the transition in fees associated with the brokerage business from 1970 to today, right? So once upon a time, um, the, the costs of trading stocks were set by a group of people who had seats at the brokerage houses and blessed by the national regulators of those exchanges. That was like 1970. Um, and each trade uh, cost, like, um, in basis point terms, um, I think the note, I think it's like, I just was looking up an academic paper about this. It was like 300 basis points per trade. Or um, uh, maybe that's too low. Yeah, no, no, yeah, 300 basis points on $10,000, um, right? Yeah, no, that's wrong. So it's, I guess it's three bips. Well, wait, I have the math wrong, but lots. Um, like, to, to translate it into, because um, it was like ten dollars per hundred, right? Is the is that right? Who's got? Who's here was worked in the brokerage business back then? Help me out. No one wants to raise their hand. Three dollars a hundred. See? Okay. So, so three dollars a hundred. Right. Three hundred basis points. Right. Like I was not. I was remembering. So what is it today? It's converging on zero. Um, so that's one thing, right? And when we think about people who benefited from that transition, um, it's not as though the people who were in that business completely went away, right? Uh, I mean, they might have gone away for other reasons, but Merrill Lynch is still around. Um, uh, Morgan Stanley's still around, right? These are businesses that were serving in that role before. They just don't make money that way anymore. And it created an opportunity for the emergence of a generational brand like Charles Schwab, right? So, so really interesting opportunity to create generational um, brands uh, and to, to take enormous costs and rents out of the system. And so where are those rents going to come from? Oh, well, I'm going to come back to that. And I'm going to talk here. Um, my presentation, I can do what I want. Um, <laughs> so, so this is a slide from McKinsey that takes global banking revenues and essentially sorts them into two buckets. Which portions are associated with credit intermedi intermediation, which is sort of the reason why we think we have banks, right? So aggregating small deposits um, and creating investment opportunities longer, right? So taking transaction dollars, uh, aggregating them within an institution. Not everybody needs to use $10 every day, so then I can lend it for a longer period of time. Um, turns out that still accounts for the majority of bank um, income, but the return on equity associated with that business is small. Right? Banks make the vast majority of uh, their profits from an ROE perspective on origination and sales. Now, to be a regulated institution, to, the reason to be a bank is for the balance sheet stuff. Anybody can do origination and sales if they plug into the bank database. Um, and so, so so if the sort of the question is why aren't banks letting this happen, right? It's because 
they're not stupid, right? They recognize that this is the way that they're currently monetizing the value associated with their, their consumer. Um, it's not in their interest to facilitate any individual's consumer's avoidance of an overdraft. It's just not. Um, so uh, if we go back then one more and ask how are banks doing as we sort of focus on the extent to which they're, they're allowing consumers to get access to data in the form that consumers clearly want to use it. So I apologize. The whole slide presentation is a bit of a work in progress. As a partner to law firm, I, like, you kind of have a lot going on, and there was this whole conference in Vegas, and you know, like, it's just hard to get everything done. Um, so I managed to get through, um, to the extent I could find them, the terms of service associated with 55 financial institutions for their basic transaction accounts, um, because I wanted to sort them into three buckets. So banks that tell consumers that they cannot share their online banking credentials with anyone, um, that it's just a violation of the terms of use associated with that bank. Um, banks that impose liability for sharing on consumers, which, bear, by, which by the way, is actually the allocation of liability under federal law. Um, uh, and banks that say, hey, I recognize that this is how you want to use, access, you want to use information associated with your account. I'm going to design a system that enables you to do it, and I'm going to protect you from any um, harm that, that might relate to that account itself, right? So that instead of merging the ability to read information associated with the account with the ability to originate a transaction, I'm going to separate those two so that you can provide read-only access, but the person who has that credential couldn't go in and, you know, take all of Michael's money. Um, and so I have, i sorry, I actually couldn't find one in the third <laughs> bucket. Um, so, so if there are enterprising law students out there who want to sort of peruse um, terms of service for various financial institutions, be my guest. Uh, you can tweet it to me at, at tpbrown5 with the hashtag open data and number four for fintech. Uh, and we'll see, if we can, we'll see if we can find one. We haven't, haven't found one, haven't found one yet. So um, super optimistic, like have all kinds of comments on the other stuff we're going to talk about, but uh, that's enough for now. Thanks, Tom. And uh, before Marisa Bell uh, joins in, let me just say for the um, aspiring law student out there, um, there are lots of examples in what we're talking about of ways to get involved. Uh, Section 1033, the first draft of it, um, was written by a law student who was working for me um, at the time, Sophie Rasman. Um, so you can do anything is the basic message. Um, that's a very hopeful note. And I didn't actually get the note about this being a hopeful presentation. So this is a little more in the fear category. Uh, and I'll tell you why. So uh, I work for the National Council of La Raza. Uh, for those who are not familiar, we are the nation's largest Hispanic civil rights and advocacy organization. And our entire mission is to improve opportunities for Hispanics. Um, so I work in our policy department uh, under economic policy, uh, focusing on wealth building policy, which includes access to banking, financial services, retirement, and housing opportunities. Um, the other policy areas that we focus on include education, access to health care, civil rights, LGBTQ, some telecom, um, et cetera. Um, but everything really, you know, going back to the mission of improving opportunities for Hispanics, really looks at how we can close the existing racial wealth gap. Um, so a lot of times when I give out statistics, it becomes sort of the doom and gloom part of a panel that I'm on. Mm -hmm. So I'm, not, I'm gonna limit them and just sort of give you some of the overviews. Um, so everyone is, is, I think, here maybe familiar with the term, the racial wealth gap. We know that there's a, an income gap correlated with race as well. But when we're talking about the wealth gap, we're looking at tangible assets that households and individuals can accumulate over a lifetime, like a home, a car, savings, retirement investments. And the point of accumulating this is to build wealth and to pass it on to the next generation, which we believe is really um, how we are going to attain middle class status for the majority of Latinos living in the United States. So um, for some of those statistics, or people who are interested in statistics, the median white household in 2011 had $111,000 in wealth holdings, compared to about $7,000 for the median black family, and $8,000 for Latinos. So that's 100,000, 7,000, and 8,000. So when we're talking about disparities, um, this was not created by the Great Recession, but it was exacerbated by the Great Recession. So we're looking at the accumulation of assets to help get us out of that hole. 
Um, so the use of big data in finance can actually be used for good, this is the hopeful part, um, but it can also exacerbate those disparities as well. Um, so when we're talking about big data in finance, um, what we're talking about and from NCLR's perspective is looking at a couple of different buckets that that falls into. Um, so there's the stuff that's always around us that's necessary, which you would traditionally use to build a credit score. There's stuff that's good for us and that can be used for good, um, like maybe bill pay history, rent history as well. And then there's the stuff that's toxic or potentially toxic. And this goes into what we would call digital redlining. So, um, you know, are lead generators being used to discriminate against people? Um, I will also say that we don't approach this subject as though we think that everyone is out to get minorities or Latino borrowers. Um, but in the same way that I, who is considered the most privileged class in the United States? Anyone? A white man. White man. Right. So I have never approached a white man and said, how does it feel to have all of the best products offered to you? I would not expect someone who is in the financial services sector, predominantly white males, to ask um, or to consider maybe the minority experience because that is not their experience. But there is a saying that says, once we know better, do better. So there may be an, a moral imperative to, to try to do better given this new, new type of technology, the new way that we can use data uh, in finances. And another way that this has been talked about that I've heard is to compare it to uh, carbon dioxide. So air is all around us and necessary, but when you break it down, you have carbon, which is toxic, and oxygen, which is good. So not to oversimplify it, but just another way of looking at how we can think about this subject matter. Uh, I will also note that in some of the, the readings that I've done, uh, there tends to be the trend that wealthy people tend to um, have more opportunities based on personal interactions and personal networks and social capital. Um, and those, are, those tend to be things or advantages that lower income people don't have. And so they tend to be subject to decisions based on them as a group. Um, and so aggregation of data, um, automation, and big data um, tends to disparately impact them for that historical reason. Um, so the decisions that are made using big data um, are not going to be affecting just line items or accounts or, or numbers. They will be affecting people. Um, and so that that's sort of drives our interest in this as well. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, can machines, which has been alluded to earlier and actually was probably stated explicitly, be expected to adjust for fairness when we know that there is bias? Um, so I'm going to just go over some of the examples, historical examples, where we have seen some of this play out. Um, we all know about the power of credit. Uh, but some people who don't know about the power of credit are people who are, not uh, who are not savvy or familiar, maybe, with the way that the U.S. financial system works, which would include immigrants and non-citizens, um, who actually have been known to have an aversion to credit because they don't want to look like they actually are in debt. So we did some field research in California a couple of years ago where we were looking at engagement in the financial mainstream for Latino families, talked to a lot of immigrant families, a lot of non-citizen households, and a lot of people told us that when they first came to this country, they did have an aversion to using credit because they didn't want to, to seem like they were um, going to be a, a burden you know, on, on a system. They wanted to be able to afford things on their own, cash base. I'm sure a lot of people understand that the, um, the employment options that they often have you sort of lead to also using cash-based systems as well instead of using a bank account maybe um, or having access to credit as a result of that. Um, so it wasn't until someone would have to go to rent an apartment or try to buy a car that they realized that the impact that credit would have and the need for a credit history. So that's not something that's necessarily um, something that is top of mind for people when they are first using the financial system in the United States. Uh, and then when people have received credit, because they might be thin file or no file, uh, the options that they have are limited and pretty bad. So the terms are not great. Um, and so language spoken and maybe assumed ethnic or racial background can also play a role in what people have had offered to them. Um, and then we all know about proxies for race and ethnicity, including education, occupation, income level, and zip code. Um, can also be used to discriminate against these people, whether or not the person on the other end or the originator of that algorithm, for instance, um, might have that in mind. Um, and also, I think it is worth noting that credit score itself can also be used for a correlation with wealth and then ultimately race. If you have a good credit score, you might be wealthier and you might not be a minority. 
Um, a specific example that we can talk to that I've been closely working with um, for our team is the payday lending space. Um, so payday borrowers disproportionately come out of uh, poor and minority communities. Um, if you know where payday stores physically are located, so not even talking about online lending, um, but physical locations tend to be concentrated in African American and Latino neighborhoods too, and that's strictly based on the fact that they know that these are people who are more, more likely to be using them. Uh, we know that there are bad products that do entrap people in cyclical debt, um, and so they know that this is a ready customer base that might have limited options for, um, for credit otherwise. Um, people who are who would have the highest odds of having used a payday loan include people without a four-year college degree, people who rent their homes, African Americans, and people who own who earn less than forty thousand dollars a year, and people who are separated or divorced. Um, of these characteristics, being African American is the single strongest predictor of using a payday loan. African Americans are one hundred and five percent more likely to use a payday loan than any other ethnic group. So, if you are a lead generator. Uh, looking to push some online loans towards someone, you can use a proxy for race, you can use something like zip code, educational attainment, make some assumptions on your own, and we know that people will be targeted um, as a result of that. Uh, now we're looking at alternative scores for credit. Um, again, another um, power that can be used for good or bad. Um, but then again, it really depends on what the intent of, of an algorithm, for instance, is um, and with what, it, with what it's going to be used for. Um, so banks use their own data to learn more about the creditworthiness of their own customers. They see rental payments, they see utility payments, et cetera, um, which can tell a lot more about their own customers using big data tools. But when we look at unregulated um, data sets or e-scores, these are really based on efficiency. So if you're driving someone to a website and that person ends up clicking on a, on a link and ends up using a loan, that's a successful transaction for you as the person who owns that algorithm or who has sold that data set. Um, so then we're looking at profits, really driving that. Not necessarily are you connecting someone with a good product that's going to help them out of a financial hole because they're looking for a loan. You're looking for, did I make a profit off of this transaction? Um, there's also lending that looks at things like social networks, um, which was mentioned before. It can benefit some and really hurt others. Um, so I think Facebook came up with a lending model where they were going to look at people's friends' networks to see whether or not that could be used to determine credit value or creditworthiness. Um, so who has decided what education institution you might be affiliated with weighs more than something else? Or if you have liked a certain band or gone to an event, um, if that's going to have a, a rating on your creditworthiness overall. Um, you can see where I'm going with this and how that could be dangerous. Um, again, it really depends on the value that's been placed on them by the human who was driving that algorithm. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, when we talk about the housing crisis, which is probably the most famous of these examples, um, lead generators really helped to push people towards toxic mortgages and bad products, um, which ended up being defaulted on more than not and led to the housing crisis. And people lost homes to foreclosure. In California, 50% people who lost homes were Latino families. Uh, so people's, impact, people's credit was impacted, um, people faced bankruptcy, no longer able to stay in a home, might not be able to build wealth enough to, to get a down payment for another home. Then this impacts um, you know, maybe where your kids are going to school, whether or not you're able to afford to put savings away. Can you still you know, contribute to your retirement account? So the long-term effects of this type of lending um, is, is pretty detrimental. Uh, another example is in auto insurance and the pricing for, um, for auto insurance for consumers, which is pretty much um, a formula that's kind of a black box for most drivers. So insurers are allowed to use factors like education, occupation, marital status, zip code to determine pricing, um, even though they have nothing really to do with whether or not you're a good driver and are actually a risk. Um, and so insurance costs actually have been known to deter people from purchasing a vehicle um, because they know that they can't afford maybe a payment on top of insurance. So this then limits your occupational options, um, where you're living, again, where you, know, you might be going to school, um, and a lot of the other economic choices and opportunities that you're going to have available to you just because you might not be able to, insure, to afford your auto insurance. So when we're looking at considerations for consumer protections, um, when we're looking at big data, um, say, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Latino names, but just using the example of Latino families, um, sometimes there's two last names. And so sometimes there's confusion about which one goes first, the, the mother's maiden name or the father's last name. Um, so if you've ever tried to correct a credit report with that 
um, being a problem for you, you know it can take some time, or if you've heard any stories about it. Um, so how do you tell an algorithm, if this is the case, this is how the individual corrects it? I mean, that just doesn't make sense because you don't know how many times this can actually happen. Is it worth it to you? It's, you know, to take that into account, um, so that ends up really hurting the consumer if they are subject to that, to that problem. Um, a lot of minority or immigrant or non-English speakers don't even know that they do have the ability to correct information if they find it, that it's wrong. They don't know where to turn to necessarily. Um, if that information isn't readily available on a website in the fine print, you might not know that you do have recourse to, to try to fix your information as well. Um, I guess I'll just, I can touch on some regulation or maybe some potential solutions. Well, um, so there is, there is room in the regulatory environment. Obviously, uh, CFPB has, done a, um, has been a big player in these conversations recently. Um, and this is really a way to get ahead of some of these issues rather than being reactionary, um, to talk about these in, in these types of spaces with the different types of people who are involved in the decision making around this. For instance, the OCC has been considering a federal bank charter for fintech companies who are using big data. We think that's positive. Um, but overall, I would say, again, sort of going back to the who is privileged in society and who's not, um, Making sure that there is diversity in, in finance in general, I think would also go a big way, a, a long way in, in positively impacting some of these trends. Um, because if you don't know to look out for some of these and flag some of these issues, you wouldn't necessarily consider it until you know, some, it's already happened, disparate impact has already affected somebody. Um, so I think that keeping that in mind, keeping people engaged in financial mainstream as much as possible, having products that are available to them that actually make sense, that are not necessarily focused on, um, on profit all the time might also go a long way. Um, consumers should really have access to, to know when credit is being used against them or just used as a value judgment um, on a transaction that they're having um, and the ability to opt into data collection um, or data sharing rather um, should, be, should be much more widespread for consumers, especially for those who might not be as engaged or savvy in the financial mainstream as well. Great, thank you very much. Um, a, a rich set of issues already, um, but uh, we're going to broaden out still. Graham. Uh, thanks, Michael. Yes, I, I am not a member of Congress. I am the staff person you usually <laughs> see sitting behind the member of Congress, scrunching his face and furrowing his brow and um, sort of making pain faces as they sort of say whatever it is they say while they at these <laughs> hearings. And I should be clear that the views that I'm going to share here are my own views. They are not the views of the Senate Banking Committee. They are not even the views of the ranking member of the Senate Banking Committee for whom I work. So, um, so there. Now I can say whatever I want to, I guess. And uh, the member I work for is actually from Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I think I have some obligatory swipe I'm supposed to take at the University of Michigan. That's what people I'm, tend to do. But when, I, when Rich Cordray get, came here, I gave him a Michigan hat to wear. So there you go. If you have any paraphernalia in, in you want to give me to take back, I'm happy to do that as well. But I understand that <laughs> I'm vaguely aware of college football standing, so maybe I'll just <laughs> leave this where it is. Um, so, you know, I think it, it, there was a good point made earlier by Tom about sort of the toxicity of the politics right now. I think a lot of the issues being raised today at this conference are really, really important, um, and they need to be looked at very, very closely, and they're evolving very very, very quickly, and unfortunately, our committee, at least, hasn't looked at any of them in the last, I would say, 21 months or so. Uh, so we're really already very far behind the curve, I think, in terms of a lot of the developments that are going on in, in the marketplace, and we were already behind in some of the work coming out of the last crisis and getting a lot of that stuff up to date. So right. we have a lot of work to do here, and, and frankly, I think it's safe to say no member of Congress ever got elected by saying, I did my due diligence about cybersecurity or fintech. You know, it's just not to them, I think, a politically um, scintillating issue necessarily, and it's not a, a, an easy thing to take back to their constituents, but it's deeply, deeply important, and it will affect them very, very deeply each time there's a data breach or as they are discriminated against in the credit markets. It is very meaningful to them. It's just sometimes hard to, to connect the dots on those things. Um, and if you want to know a little bit more about the political environment around big data. Um, some might not like that you do this, but during the break, maybe go on YouTube and, Google and, and search for the OFR is watching. Um, it, <laughs> it was a video made by the House Financial Services Committee um, in which they say all sorts of Orwellian things about the agency purely for trying to figure out what's going on in the financial markets. 
I think the chairman of the committee described it as a hacker's dream and a civil libertarian's nightmare. Um, I, I would ask you if this is a reasonable assessment of the work that the OFR is actually doing, but that gives you one sense of it. And then on the other hand, you know, agencies are often pushed to base the decisions they make off of actual data and make data-driven decisions. Uh, and yet, when Rich Cordray and the CFPB did that, they were, um, they were basically browbeaten for buying anonymized credit card data to actually try to figure out what was going on in the credit card markets so they can make informed decisions. So um, I think it's pretty clear there's an agenda there, and I'll just leave that where it is. So, um, you know, it won't shock you to hear that often members of Congress and their staffs are asked to make decisions and changes in the law that are based basically upon anecdotes but that lack reliable data. Um, you know, and the lack of high quality readily available data, you know, for example, you think about the flash crash. You know, these things happen. Um, there isn't good data sort of pointing out what the problems were and that creates uh, a delay and a vacuum that is then filled often by um, self-serving arguments or arguments that, that reinforce a particular group's pre-existing worldview. So, and, and this is true of either side of the debate, right? So industry may come in and make a self-interested argument that is not necessarily supported by data. For example, you know, the bond markets are now illiquid and we can't even trade in them. Um, on the other side, reform advocates uh, might be, make arguments about a potential future harm, but they don't have a demonstrated track record of, you know, for example, merchant banking has been risky for financial institutions to do. They can't point to, see, here's the underlying data for that. It's, it's a speculative projection forward. Um, but sometimes just having comprehensive data can move you a good ways in, towards reform, and sometimes it can help clarify what a good reform looks like and a way to do it in a narrowly targeted way. Um, you know, sometimes just shining a light on a particular practice that's going on in a market is enough to make it go away without the heavy hand of government getting in and doing anything about it. Um, and then in terms of targeted, uh, sort of studying issues and targeted reforms, you know, CFPB's comprehensive look at the way that short-term lending operates uh, and consumer arbitration really focused things on um, rollovers in the payday space. Uh, and, collect, and class action bans in arbitration as being really sort of the critical issues in those particular financial products. Um, not saying there aren't other issues there as well, but really focused in some of the reforms on those particular aspects of those products as being especially harmful. Um, I'm going to talk about another area, though. Um, after 2010, there's been a lot of talk about activity migrating from regulated bank holding companies into what for lack of a better term, has been called the, the shadow banking system. So examples of this you can think of are Blackstone buying the commercial real estate portfolio from GE Capital after it was designated for Federal Reserve regulation, or leverage lending moving into non-bank financial companies after the bank regulators put in place a leverage lending guidance. Um, and that's to say nothing of non-bank firms like Citadel getting into C, uh, CDS clearing. Um, and you sort of, on the, you're on Capitol Hill and you hear this and you think, is this good or bad? I don't really know what to make of this. People are telling me I should be worried about it. Um, how do I figure out what's going on and, and what to do about it? And so we decided to look at it. Um, you know, and we knew going into the, the inquiry, you know, there are examples of quote unquote shadow banking activities before the crisis. People have already talked about repo, uh, money market funds, things like that. We know that those were vulnerabilities. Um, but you know, there, hasn't necessarily been a lot of good observable information about specifically the narrow definition of what shadow banking is, which means a short-term runnable money-like liability that is used to fund less liquid credit, long-term credit creation. You know, there, there are some examples that OFR has actually pointed out, um, like the shift of leverage finance to, to BDCs that rely on uh, short-term wholesale funding. Um, there was a distress at a fund called Third Avenue Focused Credit Fund that basically invests in junk debt, um, but it has shares that are supposed to be redeemable on demand um, and easily traded. But these, again, were sort of anecdotes of one form or another. Um, so when we were looking at shadow banking and thinking about it, um, we had to think about things like what is the definition, what is the data people are using to measure the size of the market. And you know, the FSB alone has estimated that if you take a narrow definition of what the shadow banking market looks like is $36 trillion globally. But if you take a, the broader definition of it, 
it's $137 trillion globally. So it's basically only a difference of $100 trillion, give or take, um, potentially the size of the market. Um, but sort of talking to the relevant experts on this, and OFR was one of them, um, we sort of saw a few things um, that are going on right now that are useful in the near term, but you know, I'll talk more about this in a minute. There's a lot we don't know, and there's a lot of work left to be done. So conclusion number one that we had was there are clearly areas where potential risk migration to shadow banking needs to be monitored. And you can think of examples like the, the work that OFR has undertaken to do its bilateral data collection. You can think of the improvements to Form PF that the FSOC and the OFR and other agencies are working on together to sort of figure out what's going on in the hedge, hedge fund space. space. And then in some other areas, we actually already put the reforms in place, for example, in Dodd-Frank, um, you know, in terms of swap data, uh, and it's getting fed into the agencies, and the agencies don't, just don't have the resources to actually analyze the data itself and to make heads or tails of it. So we have a lot more work to do there in terms of information. Um, there are still reforms to some of the crisis era shadow banking issues that are unfinished. Again, repo is an example of that. Um, a potential proposal from the Fed to do universal haircuts for securities lending, and some of the security-based swap rules also haven't been finished. I mean, this is old stuff. This is stuff we knew was central, and the work is still not done on it. And I know we're eight years out of it, but there were, a lot of this stuff was allowed to metastasize over a long time. You can't immediately fix a lot of these problems. And then number three that was really important to us was that the reforms to banks, specifically, are changing some of their business practices, but we should probably have expected that to happen. Um, some institutions are adjusting their activities on activity by activity basis. Uh, some institutions are not adjusting at all. Um, but really, there doesn't appear to be some sort of contraction in available credit or any particular buildup of outside risk in some unregulated sector right now. Um, Folks have talked about it, some issues with the leverage ratio um, and declining repo volumes. You know, some might argue that's actually a feature, not a bug, of some of these reforms is that they are uh, tamping down some of these activities. Um, but there are also issues to monitor as well, like the quality of repo collateral at some of these banks that the, that the leverage ratio is actually affecting potentially that, that could impose additional risks. Um, I also say that U.S. institutions in particular actually seem to be benefiting from some of the reforms compared to their foreign counterparts. Citigroup actually bought hundreds of billions of dollars in uncleared CDS contracts from Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank because they have the capital and the balance sheet to actually handle some of these activities. So some of the reforms are actually creating a competitive advantage for the U.S. as opposed to their international counterparts. Um, one, another potential area of vulnerability that we saw was the difference between the rules the banks are subject to and the rules that non-banks that are subject to SEC and CFTC regulation are subject to on things like margin and capital. I mean, regulatory arbitrage was a central part of the crisis before, and you don't want to create an initial situation where you can move activities around to different registered entities to take advantage of some of those mismatches. So it's something that we need to be we need to keep an eye on, both in Congress and at the agencies, that the water is not going through some of the holes in the dam. Uh, so let me just say that OFR has, been, has a critical role to play by informing the debate, particularly on Capitol Hill. And the FSOC has a responsibility to direct that work, to heed it, and to act either as a council or through its members when necessary. The same is true with the CFPB and the consumer space. They need to look out for this stuff and they need to take appropriate action. Um, because that's what they're there for, and that's why we put them there. And it's the job of Congress not to interfere in that mission as they do it. Um, I'll also say Senator Brown has proposed some additional legislative proposals. Um, he hasn't introduced any bills at this time, but he's sort of floated some ideas about shadow banking, one of which is to provide the SEC and CFTC with a direct funding source. I think some folks were lauding the fact that FHFA and CFPB are not appropriated. We think that's largely, that's appropriate for those agencies as well. Starving them of resources is a good way to prevent them from doing their job in a lot of these spaces, from using that data in, in an appropriate way, in a way to protect uh, the economy and the financial system. Uh, he proposed that all the agencies have some sort of financial stability mandate if they're a member of the FSOC. That needs to be part of their mission now as well and incorporated in their day-to-day -day thinking in a lot of these issues. And then finally, 
we proposed an idea somewhat between the FSOX two authorities. They can designate entities, they can go after activities. We tried to think of something in the middle. We call it a sort of market authority uh, to either to recommend regulation of large actors in particular markets where you're seeing some harmful attributes of shadow banking sort of growing up that's growth, that's leverage, that's illiquidity, things like that. Um, that's not exactly a transformational agenda, those three things, um, but it doesn't need to be because we put in place a lot of things in 2010 that are really, really important, that are transformational, and they're just beginning to work. And, that sh and those things should drive this issue for years to come. Um, so it's important for lawmakers to listen to those experts and to follow the data wherever it leads them, wherever it leads them, whether they like that destination or not. And I just want to emphasize one thing that Marisa Bell said as part of her presentation, which is we're here to talk about data, but for members in particular, it's important to remember that there's a human side to all of those numbers. Uh, that one foreclosure might be one number in a mortgage database, but that's a whole family. That's somebody who potentially lost their job. That's uh, a kid having to move um, to a different school district. Uh, that has health effects that are very human. So like Chair Yellen once said about unemployment numbers, members of Congress always need to keep in mind, and they do to the best of their ability, that these are more than just statistics that we're talking about with a lot of these policies. So. So um, I'm going to uh, warm up the panel with a couple quick questions, then open it up um, to all of you. So let me start um, with Marisa Bell. So you, you uh, laid out a, a range of, I think, pretty brutal facts uh, about the market for minorities, particularly Hispanics, in this country and the credit market. So I, I, but I'm going to give you a chance to talk about one more, um, and that's the small business market. Uh, so um, there, uh, we think that there are a bunch of problems, I think there are a bunch of problems in the small business uh, market uh, in terms of consumer protections and access to credit uh, for minority uh, business owners um, in this country. But one of, the, um, one of the things we've always been hampered with is lack of data. Uh, the CFPB now has the authority under, those of you who are not in the audience love when we throw out these references, Section 1071, um, to collect data on um, small business um, uh, credit access. So I'm wondering, what, what are you experiencing? What are you saying at La Raza? What are the problems? And do we have the tools to address them? Um, so given the nature of employment that people tend to seek out when they come to this country, a lot of times they end up being self-employed. Um, and access to credit has been a big issue for them. A lot of times people will piece together money from family members, friends, um, you know, because they, they, there is that hole. Um, CDFIs have stepped into this space a lot, but they alone cannot carry it. Um, it continues to be a huge issue for, for minority owners. We know that, that tends to, that's like the number one growth rate in business for, for Hispanics is actually women-owned um, small businesses. Um, so this is something that I think that it has actually been a bright spot in the employment numbers uh, for Latinos. Um, but there definitely needs to be a lot more on the part of major financial institutions, major lending institutions to step into that space. So there's, um, it's not always uh, the, the worst part of a jobs report for Latinos, but it definitely um, could use a lot of support. Um, and this is uh, uh, maybe for um, Tom and, and um, Kabir to reflect on for us. So um, we talked a little bit about consumer ownership, but both of you said that's probably not enough to move the ball forward um, in, in many ways. So uh, the kinds of other things I think about are, you know, reforming our creaky old antiquated payment system um, and good funds availability and policy on overdraft. Um, how do we get our fractured regulatory system to address the set of policy issues that might matter in making um, this data access point work for everybody? Um, well, so on, on data access and setting aside the broader issues that you mentioned, uh, um, there are a number of different constituents for whom this matters, right? So you have developers, you have people who are currently providing that connective link to underlying accounts, and you have uh, financial institutions and consumers. Um, um, I, the Bureau obviously has the ability to issue a rule. I think, um, uh, I think they're unlikely to take that step in the relatively near term, and I, I worry a little bit just given 
how they've used that rulemaking authority to this point that they would err on the side of complexity um, as opposed to simplicity. Um, so I, I think the first step is sort of forcing a conversation and, and seeing the extent to which through shaming and other devices we can get financial institutions, particularly larger financial institutions, to adopt the relatively simple technology steps to live in a world where consumers can provide the access that they want to today. Um, I think it's possible to issue a rule that would have the same effect, but, but looking at the rule writing process as it's been exercised to this point, I, I have some concerns about, about whether we'd be um, content with the outcome even in the relatively near term and more broadly the extent to which it would become rapidly outmoded. I think with respect to the other issues that, that uh, you, Marissa Bell, and, and Graham and Kabir have pointed to, I, um, uh, if I had to pick one single issue, um, it would be to have uh, uh, an informed conversation about a consistent, not even just a portable financial ID, just a consistent ID that consumers could use across the many places where they interact with people who want that information, employment, insurance, financial services. Um, I recognize that the politics of a national ID are such that a technologist is afraid to utter it, <laughs> even in an academic setting. Um, so we need to rebrand it in some way. <laughs> and we have other, you know, there. You, 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 you well, unify, national unify. well, and we have, I mean, we, I like to work with stuff that exists, right? So I have a known travel ID. Why can't I use that as a way of validating my identification to a financial institution? That's a relatively simple connection to make. Um, uh, so, so looking for things that are sort of consistent with the broader objective, but practically achievable in the near term. Yeah, your question, it, I second that. On, on the on the on the ID stuff. I mean, in the UK, there's uh, there's this sort of gov.uk.verify, which is a federated system. That's an interesting model, but that's more for verification, so it doesn't really solve that foundational ID. Your question made me think of something else that we've been exploring, which is how do we improve this? How do we address this sort of balkanization of the financial regulatory environment? And and so you you know you have C CFPB, it, it, you know, it does a number of uh, sort of perhaps forward-looking things really gets ahead. But in reality, there are multiple agencies that innovators are interacting with, and ultimately that is not enough. So how do we, how do we address that? One idea that we are exploring is, is sort of modeled on, on these regulatory sandboxes uh, that have become, you know, sort of being discussed a lot lately. Um, uh, the UK one is the, the oldest, as in it's under a year old, and there are there are a number of others that are out there. In the US, it would be important to make it truly interagency. And one idea is to create a federally funded research and development center. I was talking about that. Um, so FFRDC, like the MITRE corporate, similar to that, I think. It, it's, there are models in the defense and energy um, uh, uh, sectors. And, and it's, a, it's a lab environment. It allows regulators to learn. Uh, and it creates an environment which innovators can expose exactly what they're doing with this data in ways that it, it can enhance consumer interests. And so, uh, so that's one pot potential solution uh, specifically that we are, we are working on with Joanne. So let, let me use that just as a, a jumping off point for a quick question for Graham and then I'll open it up to all of you. So Graham, um, uh, the policy world sort of intersects uncomfortably with the technology space. Uh, it's hard for policy to um, uh, uh, play ball in this space. Is there, do you think there's openness on Capitol Hill for the, to be embracing of things like a regulatory sandbox or other techniques designed to be more friendly towards using um, data and technology to solve these kinds of problems? I think yes, but um, as I said, you know, sort of the, the way that folks come to these issues with preconceived notions, there's a burden, um, well, there's a, a hurdle you have to clear on either side. Um, I think for the more consumer-minded members, they want to hear this isn't going to be a redux of 
um, you know, preemption of uh, particular kinds of anti-predatory lending laws. They, they want to hear this is going to be done in a, a way that respects consumers. Um, and I think the, the folks on the right need to be convinced that, that some of those, that, that you can't just have a space where a thousand flowers bloom completely unfettered, that there needs to be a balance between um, sort of letting the free enterprise develop and ensuring that everybody um, is respected and their financial um, protections are in place. So I think there's a space for that. Um, again, not a great environment to have one of those conversations, though, um, you know, because issues are very balkanized right now. And um, yeah, in an ideal world, everyone would sort of come to the table with an openness to give a little bit on either side so that we could see some of these benefits and try some of these things out. But, you know, I'm hopeful. You know, it'll be a new Congress next year. There'll be potentially, either way, there'll be new members in charge of our committee. So you, you, one can always hope for a, a sort of a new beginning when we get there. So let's, uh, now that we have a new beginning, let's um, open it up to some questions from all of you. Yes, down here. And there's a mic heading your way. Hi, my name's Fanny from Davis Polk. Um, I just had a question on the data access point, which is, so one of the concerns that a lot of large financial institutions cite with respect to re re allowing access to third parties um, to gain access to their customers' financial data. And one of the reasons why Jamie Dimon, for example, says they would like to push data instead of allowing companies to pull data is the sort of cybersecurity concerns. And this, this comes in, in two ways. One is that, for example, if the third party is, you know, suffers a breach of some sort, the financial institution is concerned not just about the liability, but also about the reputational risk. In another way, um, I've heard this concern voiced is that currently when third parties, like data aggregators, paying banks for access to consumers' data, they get so many requests that it overwhelms the bank's security system and sort of the IT system so that it sort of mimics what appears to be a cyber attack and it shuts down certain of the systems and um, it diverts a lot of resources that would need to, uh, that would otherwise be used to maintain cybersecurity elsewhere. And so my question is, how do you balance the, the need to allow um, consumers to be able to delegate access to their financial data with concerns around uh, system resiliency and maintaining the security of the underlying infrastructure? Let me, I'm, I'm going to say a word or two and then I'm going to let Tom jump in because I know he's anxious. Um, so I think there's an aspect of the uh, bank's um, argument um, that is true, which is you have to worry about security and privacy. Those are important values, and the resiliency of the system is an important value. And I think it's also true that in the current technological environment that the banks have chosen, those issues are um, real issues. That is, um, uh, the particular technologies that they're permitting to the extent they are, are not as secure as one would like. But the, the more fundamental point is that that's just a choice that the banks are making to keep their customers' data from being used in ways that would benefit their customers. So it's fundamentally, the technology is there. It's not a complicated, it's not a technological problem in the sense that we know what technology would fix this and be resilient, secure, and private. We're just not using it. If I could just jump in with something that's not a legal point, uh, it's a political point. Probably the loudest institution about this issue that was trying to protect their consumers' data the most, at least on Capitol Hill, opened two million unauthorized checking accounts and credit card accounts on behalf of its customers. So this issue, at least in the political sphere, has suffered a little bit of a blow to its credibility just because they weren't even watching what was going on in-house. So they're going to struggle on that front, I think, at least around the halls of Congress for the near term. So it's so wonderful to be an advocate with such wonderful witnesses. Um, <laughs> you might even think it was planned, and it wasn't. Uh, so, but let me give you an example, I think, of a way to think about it um, to demonstrate the feasibility. Um, so uh, I have a credit card, and there's a legal and technology dimension of this. 
Um, this is my card. You can all take a picture. I don't really care because if it gets breached, they'll just send me a new one, which is awesome. Um, uh, but this is a token for an account. Um, and when I present it at a point of sale, I'm providing the merchant with the ability to do read-only access into the account to which it's attached to get confirmation that I have the funds to cover the transaction. It's something that we all do millions and millions and millions of times a, a day in the United States and on a global basis. Um, uh, it is, uh, I think, we don't necessarily think of it in that function, but that is in fact the function that it provides. And, and I think what the world that, that I would like to see emerge um, with consumer, financial, com consumer permissioned access is essentially a counterpoint to the bank permissioned access that we associate with the credit card system, right? So credit card system works by banks providing permission to one another to provide that visibility into the account. And the suggestion is that a similar infrastructure should exist to enable consumers to provide third parties into visibility into that account. And the underlying resiliency and infrastructure to support it should exist to support consumer access as well as bank permissioned access. Now, I recognize that that's not a choice that financial institutions are going to want to make, and I'm deeply sympathetic um, uh, to the, the arguments and constraints that they face with respect to upgrading existing technology systems. Um, uh, and, but, right, like if I wanted to motivate that choice, um, particularly in a, in a political climate which I hope will exist um, 10 days from now, uh, like maybe a way of facing that choice is okay, right? Like we, we can create the infrastructure to support consumer, per, consumer permissioned access, or we're gonna move to a world of free account portability between the world's, the 10 largest deposit taking institutions in the United States. And you can pick. I mean, there's just no reason from a technology standpoint why it's easier for me to move my phone number from one device and carrier to another than it is to move the full panoply of routing information associated with a DDA account. This is not a technology problem. The problem is that we have, you know, to go 30 more seconds, we have a financial regulatory structure in the United States for banks, insurance companies, and others that exist to protect those institutions for good and sensible reasons from disruptive competition, right? And so if, if we want that, right, and we want to enjoy the benefits of that, some private and some public, um, then, you know, then I think we have to make some concessions when people observe that there are um, uh, inconsistencies in how people are being treated, that competition behind sort of a Rawlsian veil of ignorance would solve in five seconds if we had a more um, competitive ecosystem to support the exercise of consumer choice, i.e. exit. You mentioned both Hobbes and Rawls, so I'm now covering all the grounds here. Um, uh, uh, the bottom line is that the banks wanted to come together to address this with the, with the new players. They can. In fact, the Center for Financial Services Innovation has been conducting a group uh, of, uh, of industry actors. They've invited the banks. In fact, banks are members of CFSI. But uh, only one bank, I think, has, has, sh has showed up. That's BBVA. That could be a bank on your third column. <laughs> Um, and they just earlier this week released a set of principles around data sharing that address that particular concern. I think if they wanted to, they could address this. In fact, there are technological solutions to address that. Yes, yeah, Steve in the back. Hello, this is Steve Linder from Columbia University. Uh, thank you so much for your valuable insights. My question is, uh, does anyone on the panel have an opinion as to how the European Union's PSD2 uh, which is going to be implemented in, in 2018 will affect how banks are going to deal with the sharing of their customers' account information. Um, so, uh, one, if you've seen me talk before, you know that one consistent refrain is that um, it's embarrassing that we have to point to Europe as a model for regulatory innovation. But why, why is that? <laughs> like, um, you know, because of that whole Freedom Fries incident. Um, uh, but, um, and Brexit. Um, <laughs> Oh well, um, but the answer to your question is that it is an element of PSD2 that financial institutions have to provide for that access. Now, there is a regulatory component as well, which is interesting, which is that information service providers who gather access to that will themselves be regulated under um, uh, a, a um, member state regulatory regime that allows passporting across the entire European Union. And 
you know, among the list of things that would be awesome to cure in the United States, I talked about ID. The second is the state-by-state -state fragmentation of financial services regulation for everything other than um, banks and securities, right? So money transmission and insurance, like, it, you know, but this is not, um, uh, <laughs> not on the list of priorities, I don't think. <laughs> so basically, it's a welcome intervention. <laughs> And, and, and it's paired with the general data protection rules mm -hmm. that also came out that talk about unambiguous and informed consent that drives that. So those are actually powerful interventions and good models to consider. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're consistent with the framework, the CFSI framework that, um, that Kabir mentioned and with the Dodd-Frank law and the, and the uh, integration of, um, of uh, the ability of consumers to get access to that data. So there is potentially a set of consistent frameworks um, that could be deployed um, if we can get the regulation done on them. So let me uh, open it up for another question. Yes, Mr. Lawrence. Federal regulation of consumer information unlike Europe. Um, to what extent do you see any possibility that we could have a thoroughgoing review and rationalization of federal regulation of consumer financial and consumer data? So let me, let me say a word about that. And again, I know Tom would like to say the opposite. Um, so, what? Yeah. Um, so there, there are certainly there are costs to state-by-state -state regulation in terms of efficiency. Uh, but there are also some gains to having state-by-state -state regulation as well. And I think they're often, we go through these cycles of remembering and forgetting, and I think that's one of them. So uh, for example, in the lead up to the financial crisis, some states actually got um, consumer protection regulation a lot better than the federal government. And it helps to have some experimentation at the state level so that you make it maybe less likely that the federal government will get it wrong. And you know, I've spent a lot of time in the federal government. I would be the last person to say the federal government always gets things right. Um, so I, I kind of think in that trade-off that the efficiency loss is worth the gain of experimentation and additional protection in letting states say for themselves, like, what is the good life in our state? Um, yeah, so I, I love the Brandeisian notion of um, states acting as laboratories for uh, experimentation with respect to legal and economic policy. Um, that's not the experience I have in practice in dealing with them. And the way, the, the, the sort of thought experiment that, that I use is that, um, uh, and this has been true of every entrepreneur and company I've ever worked with, uh, um, they rail against the state-by-state -state regulatory regime until they have scale to pay the costs to comply with it, and then they're content. <laughs> and so what that suggests to me, right, is that there's an important unrepresented interest in the regime that we now have. And again, I'd sort of point to some regulatory developments in Europe. Um, uh, we don't have a constituency that represents the future in the United States, right? And it seems sort of Star Trekian, right? But this idea of a ministry for the future to sort of participate in regulatory debates to support review of existing regulatory regimes, um, I think has some value. Again, I think n not any time soon, um, but, but like it's helpful to sort of articulate that, that it is, that, that there is an aspiration, that we aspire to something better than the current, the, the current fractiousness and rent seeking that emerges from our existing regulatory regime that there that there is a place that we can see that is a better um, policy and political environment than the one that we currently live in and you know and you have to marry the practical with the um, um, uh, the, the poetic but you know like we shouldn't forget the poetry I, if you <laughs> Um, I, I think um, this isn't about privacy and customer privacy agencies. This is about financial regulatory agencies more generally. 
They tried to do that in 2009. The chairman of the Banking Committee put out a proposal that would have consolidated all the financial regulators. That blew up in his face. He ran away from that one about as fast as he could. We got rid of the OTS, and that was about it. Um, you can argue that, I mean, it, it, the system we have right now doesn't make sense if you were going to design it from scratch right now. Um, I do think there are some benefits to it. You know, the OCC is being very forward-looking about some of these issues and thinking about them. One could argue because they want to get more chartered institutions, that's more, more funding for the agency, and that's a benefit to them. But then what happens if some of the companies say to the, they, they try to crack down on certain practices and the companies say to them, well, now we're just going to switch our charter to a state or to some other agency. Well, then you've got a potential problem. So uh, there are benefits and there are costs to the way we do things right now. Um, and it's complicated, but yeah, I, I don't think there are a whole, there aren't a whole lot of non-entrenched interests who see this system as the ideal one, put it that way. Say uh, just one more word about poetry, and then I think we have time for one more question, um, which is just reminded of uh, Mario Cuomo um, uh, famously said, uh, we, we campaign in uh, poetry, and then we govern in prose. Um, and thinking about this last election cycle, um, I mean, I guess we're campaigning in doggerel. Um, I'm not sure what that means we're <laughs> going to govern in, but Dick has the answer. <laughs> I'm just going to go for one which I think is, uh, is applicable to this session, because I learned a lot from it, so I, I thought it was quite good. And his quote is that reason may be the lever, but sentiment gives you the fulcrum and the place to stand on if you want to move the, the world. And we've heard, heard a lot of good sentiment here so that we can change the world. So, uh, we're going to leave it at Holmes. Um, and um, we're going to take a 15-minute break. Uh, we will reconvene at 5 of for an uh, introduction of our keynote speaker, which will begin promptly at 4 o'clock. Uh, Sendhil Mulanathan will be joining us then, if he's not already uh, somewhere out here. <laughs>